Welcome, my name is Dr. Warwick Bishop. I'm a cardiologist, I'm an author, and a keynote speaker. I'm CEO of the Healthy Heart Network. I'm all about trying to help people live as well as possible for as long as possible. Heart disease is huge in Australia. Every 20 minutes, someone suffers a heart attack. Most of these could probably have been avoided if only we knew what to do. This podcast is all about helping you understand blood pressure, weight, cholesterol, for better health. If you enjoy this podcast, I would be honored for a five-star review. You can share it with your family and friends. It may well save someone you love. Hi, my name is Dr. Eric Bishop and welcome to my podcast and videocast station. As always, I'm super grateful you've taken the time to tune in. And if you enjoy my podcasts, please share them with someone who you think they will benefit and please subscribe. You can do that through Spotify or Apple or any of the platforms. I'm on just about every one of them. Well, with that aside, what would I like to talk about today? You may be aware from other podcasts, I've touched on the importance of bone health. Now, part of the reason I've touched on that is because with my partner Shell here in Hobart, we've opened a franchise business called OsteoStrong. If it's in your part of the world, I suggest you check it out. OsteoStrong is all about improving bones, balance and strength for individuals. Now, that can be any comer because we can improve athletes, we can improve run-of-the-mill people, so the average Joe Blow off the street, and really importantly, we can improve people who are deconditioned, who are moving towards frailty, who maybe have osteoporosis or osteopenia, two, two different extremes of thinning bones. So my interest is about making sure I can give the best information to the people who come through our center in regard to their bone health, because we might be able to help them. So what I'm going to do is share a little bit of information from the Australian Family Physician. So these are the sort of guidelines and some of the uh, concepts that GPs will have in regard to osteoporosis. So who do they consider should be considered for bone mineral densitometry? So bone mineral densitometry, bone mineral density, BMD, is done using what we call a DEXA scan. So that's a dual x-ray absorption scan. And that scan is used broadly, is reproducible. It's what we've used in studies. And it gives us a really nice idea of how dense, how the health of your bones is, mainly in um, hip and in spine, compared to an average 30 year old of the same sex. So who should we be doing bone mineral density checks on? So this is where the Australian family physician and general practice um, recommendations sort of sit. They recommend for anyone over 70 years of age, and I'm not going to speak to the Medicare rebate on this. This is a conversation for you to have with your GP and for you to think about in your own context. I'm not talking about the uh, rebateable scans, that, that's a different story. And um, you can obviously flag that with your GP. I'm talking about where the current sort of practice suggestions are in general practice. So people over 70 years of age are considered reasonable people to get bone mineral density uh, undertaken on. Then we look at men over 50 or women Well, I'm going to say that again. Then we look at men over 60 or women over 50. If there's any of these following risk factors or if you like potentiators of potential for osteoporosis, and that includes a family history. So if there's bad bones in the family, then if you're a woman over 50 or a man over 60 might be a really good opportunity to be thinking about scanning. Remember that difference of 10 years is exactly what we see in cardiovascular disease, except it's the other way around. 
in cardiovascular disease, men hit the problem about a decade earlier than women. And that's really because of that protective uh, role of the estrogens for women in cardiovascular disease. In bone health, it's reversed. Men hit problems after women. Women hit it first, often because of uh, hormonal related issues. So their loss of um, their uh, sex hormones or the reductions of sex hormones during menopause uh, is Im- implicated, but also women tend to be lighter and have a less greater bone mineral density to start with. So if they're losing um, from a lower level, they're going to be in a um, high risk scenario earlier than men. So just think about that. Men and women different in their risk for cardiovascular disease, men first, women second. For bone health, women first, men follow. So men over 60, women over 50, if there's a family history of bad bones, think about getting a bone mineral density done. If there's a smoking history, believe it or not, cigarette smoking reduces bone mineral density. And that really, as far as I understand, is to do with the um, those compounds within cigarettes interacting with the uh, coal face of bone mineral density um well, the cells osteoblasts and osteoclasts, which lay down and absorb uh, bone and throwing that out of balance. Importantly, alcohol will do it too. Two to four standard drinks per day can come back and cause problems with the bones. So keep a close eye on that. If there's a lack of calcium in the diet, hard to know who would be at risk of that. Perhaps people who have strict vegans, Uh, perhaps people who just have poor nutrition. Also, we know that people of low body weight and particularly uh, eating disordered people who are of low body weight uh, can run the risk of osteoporosis because they just don't have the nutritional component. People who are at risk of increased falls may well benefit from bone mineral density just to make sure that those falls aren't going to put those people at significant increased risk. And sedentary lifestyle, really important. We know that maintaining activity once you're 25, 30 odd years of age and ongoing slows rate of bone mineral density loss. So they're the sort of risk factors that if they're occurring within uh, your life, or within the life of someone who you care for, you may wish to flag that they have that conversation about bone mineral density with their general practitioner. Really important that we also think about medical conditions that could be associated with increased risk of thinning bones. Now, importantly, things like endocrine problems, and we were talking about uh, the sex hormones. So for women, early menopause could be a problem. Males who have, for various reasons, loss of testicular function. They may have had that through surgery for prostate-related issues, for example. People who have thyroid issues and hyperparathyroid issues. Now, what does that mean? Thyroid is a sort of a regulator of how the body idles, if you like. Um, it's a metabolic guide. If your metabolism is increased, then you turn over all sorts of things and you can weaken those bones. Parathyroids. Para means beside or next to. Parathyroid glands actually sit right next to the thyroid gland. They're almost indiscernible. And the parathyroid glands are super important and central for regulation of calcium within the bloodstream and the body. So if they're playing up, increased amounts of calcium can be reabsorbed and brought into the bloodstream and can weaken the bones. Inflammatory conditions in the longer term, things like rheumatoid arthritis, people with ankylosing spondylitis, people with um, gut-related problems, particularly malabsorption. If you've got a problem with absorption in the top part of your gut, you may not be absorbing uh, the calcium magnesium that you need to. We also know that people with inflammatory bowel disease can have an inflammatory process affecting the whole body, and these inflammatory processes can also impact bone health. Of course, people who go through major procedures like organ transplant or bone marrow transplant, these individuals end up on significant 
medications, which can not only dampen down the immune system, but then can have an impact on bone health. As you might imagine, because the kidney is central in the regulation of calcium, phosphate, magnesium, chronic kidney disease can drive bone health problems as well and can often drive secondary hyperparathyroidism. That's actually a talk of its own on another occasion, but there's a lot of complex interplay. But just be aware, chronic kidney disease can be a marker or a real flag for people who could be at risk of osteopenia, a little bit of bone loss, or osteoporosis, significant bone loss. As you might imagine, alkaline phosphatase, which tries in with uh, bone health as well, is central in liver function. So chronic liver disease or any problems with the liver can be a really big issue. Beyond that, one of the most important things that I saw in this document that I'm referring to from the Australian Family Physician are the drugs that can be involved. Now, I'm going to read those out so I don't miss any of them, but most importantly are things like corticosteroids. Corticosteroids, without question, are a major uh, risk when it comes to reducing bone mineral density. So who gets corticosteroids? people with bad lung disease, in particular asthma, they may get multiple doses of corticosteroid over a lifetime. That's a real red flag and really should be driving us to ask the question, could this person be at risk of low mineral, uh, bone, low bone mineral density and therefore should we be getting a scan? Increased thyroxine, so over treatment with thyroxine for someone who's got a thyroid issue. Uh, anti-androgens. So testosterone probably builds bones from all our research. So an anti-testosterone agent, which might be used for someone who's got a sex hormone sensitive tumor like prostate cancer, can lower bone mineral density. Anti-estrogens for the same reason. Someone who's got a, a, a tumor that could be uh, sex hormone sensitive could be put on an anti-estrogen. Think someone who's got breast cancer, for example. And you may not have guessed this, but anti-epileptic medications can also alter bone mineral density. And the way they do that is they accelerate the turnover of some of the components that are really important in bone mineral maintenance. But here's the one that really caught my eye. If you've heard of the more recent line of antidepressant agents, which many, many people are on, they're called S. SRIs. These are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they keep high levels of serotonin within our uh, gaps between our neurons and that, well, that basically results in an improved mood. It's a therapy for depressive uh, illnesses. Now, why is that important? Well, so many people are on SSRIs. And so we really need to be asking the question of these large number of people, should we be looking at their bone mineral density sooner rather than later? And I think the answer to that question is pretty straightforward. One of the other agents, which isn't even listed on this uh, GP list, is the proton pump inhibitors that live, well, <laughs> that, live, that we take to treat acid reflux and peptic symptoms. So the omeprazoles or the pantoprazoles of this world, the Somax, the Nexiums, long-term therapy for these can alter uh, absorption of calcium and therefore impact on bone mineral density health in the long term. If I've not touched on just about everyone in the community, I'd be surprised because there are so many people impacted by these different factors that can feed into bone health. The last one I'm going to mention because it's on this list is a condition called multiple myeloma. Now, it's a that's a bone cell cancer of its own. Again, it almost needs a, a whole podcast of its own to describe it. But we know that multiple myeloma, a form of uh, blood or bone marrow cancer can lead to thin um, and reduced uh, thin bones and reduced mineral density. Super, super duper important. Well, 
I think I'm going to wrap that up there. What I would like to do is come back on another occasion and talk about the blood tests that you might speak with your GP about getting. If you've been diagnosed as osteoporosis or osteopenia and you want to be just making sure you're covering as many bases as possible. Now, my disclosure here, and I've said it before, I'm a cardiologist. That's where my absolute expertise uh, sits and where I'm able to be fairly clear about exactly what information I offer in this space. I'm a doctor. I've got lots of experience. I have done basic physician training, but this area is not my absolute box and dice. I'm happy to give people information that they can think about and talk with their own uh, personal physician, whether that's their GP or their bone doctor or their endocrinologist or their rheumatologist and cover uh, those conversations or help uh, support those conversations so that you get the very best health care for yourself. So I'm all about trying to make sure you're as educated as possible so that you can take that information with you and it can be uh, contributory to your best health journey. For now, though, I am going to wish you the very best. I do hope you live as well as possible for as long as possible. I really, again, appreciate you tuning in and having a listen. It really means a lot to me when people come up and let me know that they've been enjoying these podcasts. If you do think of someone uh, who these podcasts could help, and I try and be broad and sensible and pragmatic and all those things, please share it with those people. And if you subscribe, that's absolutely fantastic. If you want to try subscribing, I'd love that too. For now, I wish you the very best. I hope you live as well as possible for as long as possible. Take care and bye for now. Hi, ever wondered what your risk of heart attack is? You should. It's the single biggest killer in the Western world. We're talking one death less than every 30 minutes in Australia, one death less than every 60 seconds in the United States, nine million deaths globally per annum. Well, how do you check your risk? Well, you can go to www.virtualheartcheck.com.au. You'll find out about your risk and what can be done beyond that to be even more precise.